So today I'm going to um, explore with you this phase of disillusionment. Um, and it's, it's an intense phase. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> it's intense. You may remember um, on the first session that um, we came in here and I was like, you know, I've never been on a retreat in a pandemic before. <laughs> never done that. And it's intense. Um, and I also, you know, reminded us that there's a lot of racial turmoil and atrocity that is happening right now. And we started with really gathering our attention and settling in slowly so that we could begin to face it with a steady mind and a tender heart. Um, it's hard to do. It's hard to really be willing to be that spiritual warrior and to look at things clearly. Um, and also to be able to see them and realize that, yes, it's personal and it's not personal at the same time. And that's what we learn uh, to deepen into in our practice as well. So this is a very challenging time. It requires a lot of tenderness, a lot of gentleness, and then a lot of dedication. And I know that this group is sincerely dedicated to it, or you wouldn't be here. In disillusionment, this is the phase that all of our shit comes up. <laughs> we might think when we first start to practice that we can get out of it. I know I did. Um, it didn't take me too long as a child to look around at my fellow Christians and say, huh, you're supposed to do unto others as they would have do unto you? Really? You know, really? Are we really doing that? I did it. You know, I grew up in the South. I grew up in a small town in the South. I grew up middle class. I have privilege. I'm white. I was able to go to college in C State University. Um, and that's a privilege. Um, and I saw around me that things didn't line up, things that I were being told. It didn't really, it wasn't really true in my experience. So I went on retreats to deal with my own trauma and my own pain. And I got a lot of it, you know, everyone does from sexual abuse to my uncle being murdered for being gay to you name it. You know, it's like we all bring this stuff into our practice. We don't just leave it behind. But yet when I first started, I was like, I can't get out of this. This is my way. I thought I found my way out. Um, I didn't realize at the time that what my practice was going to ask me to do was go into the pain. <laughs> it was going to take me right into it. And it took me a while and I'm still grappling with it. This loving awareness, you know, that holds everything and everybody. But yet I can look around and say, what the fuck? You know? Like, what is loving awareness doing to each other? This doesn't make any sense. You know, the rational cognitive mind, it doesn't make any sense. And it's heartbreaking. And it seems like in this phase of disillusionment, it comes up again. It comes up like 10,000 million times more than you ever think it could come up. All right. It comes up and it says it wants our attention. And not only are we in various places in disillusionment in our personal systems, in our personal lives, you know, you might be going through a divorce on top of all this, and I know some of you are, but we're also in a massive collective global disillusionment. Okay, we're in a moral crisis. We're in a spiritual crisis. We're in a religious crisis. Um, the surveys that you all filled out before we started this, we asked you a question about where do you fit on the spectrum between religious and spiritual? And I tell you, most of you fit right in the middle. You were like a three. This group was like a three. <laughs> it's not really secular and it's not really religious. So who are we? You know, who are we? This middle path that the Buddha talks about. Um, who are we as we... Um, discover a new way of centering and centering not just with 
not just with um, our secular or spiritual or secular religious identity, but centering around our cultural identities too. Opening and expanding. That's what our practice asks us to do. And in disillusionment, Sharon Salzberg, I think she says um, it best in some ways, it says, waking up from our most cherished illusions is a vital step in spiritual maturity. So in disillusionment, we're really asked to wake up from our most cherished illusions so that we can actually become spiritually mature. Um, it's not about, uh, it's not all bliss <laughs> and joy. We're not going to get out of it in the way that you think. All right, think. Um, the only way out is through, is the old saying. Um, and as we learn to open into this loving awareness, we can see it differently, and we do learn to relate to it differently. It does not take away the pain. It does not take away the pain, and yet it allows us to sit in the discomfort in a way that we can start to respond without needing to fix things and manipulate things. Um, because responses that come from there, you may have realized in your relationships don't always work out, all right? And responses that come from there may not in the long run serve us because what if we have to get more uncomfortable before we get comfortable, all right? And that's where we are right now. We're in this massive disillusionment and discomfort. Everyone feels it. Who does not feel the discomfort? Anybody's hand going to raise? Nah. Ruth King, a black meditation teacher, she says, we've got issues around domestic terrorism. We've got misogyny, sexism. We can almost say we got it all in this bag. Our social time, including just a lot of political chaos that's running amok. And in some way, we could say that these are all belonging issues. These are issues that are very much rooted in who belongs and who decides. And it's also a reflection of a divided heart mind. What we see in the social world arena right now is a reflection of mind. It's a reflection of how we're being conditioned. It's the blooming of consciousness that's really calling for our attention around these issues. And attention is a form of love. So all of the heartbreak needs our attention right now. And in our practice is where we learn that we can and that we are incredibly strong human beings and that we can sit in this and respond with care. We're moving into paradox in our practice stillness and movement, sitting and acting. James Baldwin says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So as we deepen in our practice, hopefully we increase our inner resources with concentration, the mind calms and steadies. It's like lotion for dry skin. We can remain stable as thoughts begin to arise and pass, as feelings arise and pass, as the breath moves in and out. So we begin to see the suffering more and more clearly and where our cognitive dissonance doesn't really line up with what we thought we knew. So you might have an insight in your practice. Oh, whoa, there goes that thought. It just arose and it passed away. What? I'm not my thoughts. I don't have to center around my thinking. Hmm. I'm not my feelings. They arise and pass. I don't have to center around my feelings. I don't have to center around my breathing. I don't have to center around my ideas of who I am. Hmm. I don't have to center around my whiteness. Well, then who the fuck am I? What is this center? You know, if we can deepen into loving awareness, we can orient here. All right. And our personalities and our identities can start to do its dance. 
Ruth King, again, she says mindfulness meditation is a powerful tool because when we get ourselves still, what we can really begin to see is how the mind does what it does. And the beautiful thing about mindfulness is that instead of being the activity of the mind, we can witness the activity of the mind. That's a very profound shift in relating to our lives when we can shift from being the activity of the mind to witnessing the activity of the mind. So that's what we're starting to do in our practice is we're starting to be able to come into the sense that, oh, there's a lot of space here. There's a lot of love here. And when I can witness it, I can engage in this differently. There is a sense that there can be this inner freedom that arises. And this is really difficult during disillusionment to continue to come back, to continue to come back, to continue to soften. Because in disillusionment, the mind states that are the most intense, that's what arises. Confusion is one of the things that's most reported, so along with anger, along with fear, along with doubt. These are the ones that really come up during the disillusionment phase. Because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's on the other side. And what's on the other side is imaginary. We can imagine it, but we really don't know. All right? And part of the key to disillusionment is to soften into this not knowing. Like Francis said yesterday, know that you don't know. Know that there is this uncertainty here, that this could be our last moment together. And from that wisdom and that preciousness, then maybe it will re-enliven your dedication to coming into form, coming into humanness in a way that connects us instead of divides us. And when we do this, we're also committing to dealing with all of our shadow all of the stuff that we don't mm-hmm. want to see. And when we really do that, we deepen even more into this understanding that everything can be held with loving awareness. Because when you accept it here, you can accept it there. All right. If you accept it there, then hopefully you can accept it here. Tokupal Turner in Belonging Ourselves Home, she says, there is a special quality of stillness in a person who encounters their shadow wholeheartedly. Your body may relax in their company because it understands in a subtle communication of their presence that nothing is excluded in themselves or you from belonging. Such a person who has given up guarding against the shadow who has come to wear their scars with dignity, no longer squirms from discomfort or bristles at suffering. They no longer brace in avoidance of conflict. They carry a deep willingness to dance with the inconstancy of life. They've they've given up distancing as a strategy and made vulnerability their ally. And vulnerability is an acquired taste. It's an acquired taste. So is really deepening into loving awareness. That is also an acquired taste. It puts us on the spot like nothing I've ever felt before. Jack Kornfeld in A Path with Heart, he says, true maturation on the spiritual path requires that we discover the depths of our wounds as Ajahn Chah put it, if you haven't cried a number of times on the meditation in meditation, it really hasn't begun. So just to say, like, yes, difficult emotions are going to come up. Difficult patterns and constellations of your experience that some are yours, some are the collective, some are passed down in your DNA from epigenetics. Um, not necessarily our fault and yet it is our responsibility to continue to soften to continue to breathe 
to continue to face whatever is happening, welcoming all that there is so that we can respond without the reactivity that's just going to make it worse. It's just going to make it worse. So as you find yourself in this phase of disillusionment, whether individually or collectively, one of the things that I found is that there needs to be a willingness to look at our preferences and to look at our ideals. There needs to be a willingness to soften to really examine what suffering am I not going to be able to get out of, like sickness, old age, and death, according to the Buddha? And what suffering am I able to alleviate? The Buddha had this pointer about an arrow, and it basically says that um, if you get struck by an arrow, do you then shoot another arrow into yourself? So meaning something can happen. Someone hurts you or says something that hurts your feelings and it comes in your sense doors. And in that moment, it's like, can you just be with that discomfort and be with that pain so that it can move through us? Or are you already jumping to like, oh my gosh, that person is horrible. I really am not going to be their friend anymore. I'm, I don't even know what to do. And you, know, and you just proliferate around whatever is happening. And you just shoot yourselves with more arrows. All right? So really, it's to come back home, come back here, soften. Tara Brock says, healing and freedom come from non-proliferation of our thoughts. Non-proliferation means we have the wisdom in our lives to pause and re-arrive in the present moment. In that manner, we can tap the wisdom and the kindness that is intrinsic to our nature. We then can respond with intelligence instead of a kind of fear-based reaction. And as we do, as we do this work, we start to realize more and more deeply that it isn't all pain, that the Buddhist philosophy points us to 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows, and that as we increase in our ability to say both and, both and instead of either or, and we increase in our ability to see our impact of our actions and not just focus on our intentions, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intention. The impact is important. So as we learn to see these things more and more clearly, sit in the discomfort, non-preference it, meaning that pain can be here and I don't push it away. I don't cling to it. Joy can arise. I don't push it away. I don't cling to it. These things can happen. There's more and more and more spaciousness. Tara Brock says, joy naturally arises from a heart space that welcomes all there is. So by welcoming all there is, there can be a sense that joy arises simply and ordinarily without Netflix, without, you know, a beer or wine or whatever our thing of choice is to get in touch with that, like, ah, spark, that actually here. We can feel this. We can get in touch with this. And then, it, and then it spreads. It spreads. And then we've seen in your social meditation that it's not all up to me. We're in this together. Your joy helps my joy. My joy helps your joy. And we can share. And we can do this dance together. So it's an intense time right now, you all. And we're not going to get out of it necessarily through our sitting practice. It'll take us deeper into it, but we will get through it. And we will get through it one step at a time, one heartbeat at a time, one breath at a time.